Oh my gosh, do I have a podcast episode for you. This might be my favorite episode in a long time that I have done as an interview. I just had such a great time speaking to Cheryl Paul, author of The Wisdom of Anxiety. She is a Jungian counselor and she is very well known for helping people to understand anxiety, especially understanding highly sensitive tendencies and what that looks like and navigating that in this world. So in this episode, we do explore quite a great deal around anxiety in relationships and love and knowing you with the right person and all of those things. So you will get a lot out of this episode if that's a particular element that comes up for you, but also really exploring the idea of how sensitive we are, how normal that is, and how when nurtured in the right way, we can really feel safe in this world, but so often we are not nurtured in that way. And so we're diving in to those questions. Is this normal? Am I supposed to be happy all the time? What is wrong with me? Really delving into the gifts of anxiety, the wisdom that is behind your anxiety. Cheryl has inspired me so much in my work and really aligns with the messaging. I remember the first time I picked up her book and read the opening lines, I was blown away. I was like, oh my gosh, someone sees anxiety the same way that I do. Someone can see and put words to what I'm trying to say and explain as well. This is incredible. And so I've learned so much from her, but also just felt incredibly validated in seeing her work as well. Oh, this was a dream come true moment for me. I've been wanting to have her on the show for a long time, but really waiting for the right time. And now it feels so right to share this with you. Okay, let's go to the show. Cheryl Paul, welcome to the show. It has been a long time coming having you on the Anxiety Reset podcast, and I'm so happy to finally have you here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now you have written what I would say is quite a Bible, a fundamental book for people with anxiety called The Wisdom of Anxiety. And you have so much wisdom yourself to share on this topic. I'm just going to start us nice and general. What is it that you wish more people knew about anxiety? Mm. Good question. Um, I wish people understood that as uncomfortable as anxiety can be, that like all of our symptoms, it is a messenger. Mm -hmm. So that is my bottom line fundamental message about anxiety is that anxiety is trying to communicate something to us, that it is not evidence of brokenness. It is not evidence of disorder. That doesn't mean that it feels wonderful. It doesn't, it feels horrible, but it is here to communicate something, some way in which we are being asked to pay attention. And it could be something physically. It could be something emotionally. It could be something in the way our, where our thoughts are functioning in our cognitive realm it could be something spiritually. So I think a lot in terms of the four realms of self, body, heart, mind, soul, spirit, um, and how we might be off kilter in any one of those ways or in all of those realms, right? How we might be off kilter in terms of um, just how we're tending to ourselves. And, you know, I think it's important to say that our culture does not make it easy to tend to ourselves. And so I don't say this with any kind of blame towards the individual. We are part of a collective. We are part of systems that do not nourish and nurture our individual well-being. So that said, there is still a lot that we can do on the individual level to find more well-being. Yeah. And oh my gosh, the way you articulate and speak to anxiety in this way, it, you're so speaking my language. Like the minute I opened your book and started reading the words, I was just like, yes. 
there is something I, oh my gosh, it's escaping me right now that you say anxiety is both the wound and the, I think something around like the pathway to healing, right? It's like, it's both our wound and our way of, of, of kind of seeking within and finding a way out. Um, feel free to correct me on that, Cheryl, if you remember the line that, you know, I think it was Rumi who said the cracks are where the light comes in. Um, and so it's very much a mystical also Jungian Carl Jung speaks a lot about that. It's through our wounds that we arrive at more wholeness, that we arrive at more growth and healing. So we think of wounds in the Western mindset as something to just kind of get rid of, to, put a bandaid over to, you know, deny and ignore and distract from. And there's another mindset that says, well, the wounds are here. We can run all we want, but they're still going to follow us wherever we go. And so we might as well turn to face them and have a relationship with them and become curious about them and recognize that anxiety, the goal is not even to get rid of anxiety. Anxiety is part of how we're wired right? But it's to have a different relationship to anxiety so that it's not in the driver's seat of our life. Yeah, totally. I often say I wouldn't want to get rid of my anxiety because, hey, like, you know, if I'm in an emergency situation, I want some anxiety there, like to keep me safe and to help me function in that emergency. That's right. From a biological perspective, anxiety has kept us alive as humans, right? And so we understand more and more the anxiety, the amygdala, it's our warning system. When there's actually real and present danger, we do want to be alarmed. We do want to be awake. But for highly sensitive people, we tend to, we're scanning always. We're scanning the horizon. We're scanning the perimeters, looking for danger, looking for anything that seems off and off kilter, we're hyper vigilant, and so we have to learn how to take the gift of being somebody who is so aware of everything all the time, right? Every little tingle in our bodies that can then mushroom into health anxiety. Every single um, bodily symptom in a relationship that can morph into relationship anxiety. So we have to be so mindful that we're because of our high awareness and attunement to things that typically wire people aren't necessarily aware of all the time, it can get us into trouble, right? So how to recognize the, the breadth of the floodlight of what we're seeing and sensing, and then developing the skill set to use that in a way that serves us. What do I choose to pay attention to? What do I choose to set aside? How do I want to work with this gift that can so often feel like a burden. Yes, absolutely. Now this term highly sensitive person, we do mm. see this around social media a lot. It's becoming part of our popular culture. Would you mind sharing some, some clarity on that term and how someone might know or identify as being a highly sensitive person? Yes. So Elaine Aaron brought this term to our world and, um, and I think she did research with somebody else, but she is mostly credited. And it was about 1995, somewhere around there that she published the book, The Highly Sensitive Person. And it was, I think, part of her PhD, and then it evolved into a book. And so she did pretty extensive research showing that across species, about 15 to 20% in every species is highly sensitive, meaning highly aware of things that typically wire people are not aware of in their environment from the emotional to the physical to the spiritual and highly sensitive people typically in a culture were the ones that were scanning and looking out and aware of oh wait a minute that food might be a little bit off maybe we shouldn't eat it so aware of textures and senses and sight and sound and emotions um and emotional, she was speaking mostly on the emotional level. So highly sensitive children, which I have two of, which I, which were, you know, we have two highly sensitive sons who are now 14 and 18. Um, and I have a highly sensitive husband and I'm highly sensitive myself. And it's a spectrum, of course. So I work with people on the far end of high sensitivity and I work with people more towards the middle right? So like everything else, it's on a spectrum. There are highly, highly, highly sensitive people. And then there are just regular old highly sensitives. Um, so it's, it's, it's an emotional attunement 
that for many people shows up as um, more prone to awareness of the loss that is part of our world, that loss, change, death exists. So a lot of people who find me are aware of this from the time they're five years old, right? Whereas a typically why a person is just kind of going around their life, having fun, playing baseball, whatever, the highly sensitive part, five-year-old suddenly becomes aware that death exists and loss and change exists and everything around us is going to change and eventually die. And what do you do with that when you're five or six or seven, right? And we don't have a culture that has language for that. Yeah. And so these are also kids who are, they feel everything, feel into in such a beautiful way um, that all life matters. And so like when my kids were younger, we had a hard time going for bike rides because they didn't want their bicycle to run over an insect on the road, right? Such a high level of awareness that life and death are here and that all creatures matter, right? And, you know, spiders should need to be taken out of the house and not smushed and killed. So it's, 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 it's I don't think a spider has been killed in, in our house and since our son was born, right? We just don't do that. And we've, so we've learned a lot from our children. Um, I don't know that we would have done that anyway, but we probably would have been more prone to do that. Um, so it's 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 a just stunningly beautiful population of human beings that have not been honored for who they are. They've been shamed, judged, sidelined. Very difficult to be a highly sensitive child in this world, in school, the demands that we make to show up, to learn in a certain way right? To socialize in a certain way. Um, and especially difficult to be a highly sensitive boy, I think, but across the board, it's just a challenging temperament. And so people grow up feeling like my sensitivity is a burden and then it often morphs into anxiety. So the way that I conceive of it is that when the sensitivity is honored, it can be channeled into our gifts, our spirituality, our creativity, our innovation, our passions. And when it's shamed and in any way, when we receive any messages around this is this is evidence of brokenness, it often then morphs into anxiety. And that's where we see a lot of intrusive thoughts, OCD, that channel, right? To try to make sense of and create some kind of scaffolding and foothold around feeling really feeling groundless and vulnerable in this world and I would add to our society our culture just doesn't know what to do with that what do we do with sensitivity take a shot of concrete we say in Australia get on with it oh harden up is what that means yeah (laughs) yeah that's a good one I haven't heard take a shot of concrete so right it's get over it right get on your on your big boy boots your big girl pants and just move on That's the message that a lot of children heard growing up. It's starting to shift. It is starting to change in the parenting culture where we are recognizing um, the beauty of emotional intelligence, right? That we have language now that we didn't even have 10 or 20 years ago around raising emotionally intelligent and intact children where their sense of self is still intact, even though they're going to encounter hard things in the world. It's not about protecting them from all the hard things. Right. But yes, in general, the culture really has no idea what to do with sensitivity. It has been shamed and judged and pounded out of most people, and but it doesn't go away. It just shows up somewhere else as anxiety, as addiction, as depression, as eating disorders, right? All kinds of ways. Which just really speaks to how powerful unconditional love support and acceptance can be for human beings how healing that is and so a little child as you said feeling different in this world feeling very sensitive when given the right environment can absolutely thrive yes there's the um, the orchid metaphor that is often used around high sensitivity raising a highly sensitive child that with the right conditions highly sensitive child will become an orchid, right? The most beautiful flower, but orchids require just the right conditions in order to thrive. 
So yes, those conditions are love and acceptance and nurturing attunement, paying attention. What does this, what does my child need in order to thrive? It's not going to be the cookie cutter version. It's not going to be what your friend's next child's next door is thriving. That's great that that kid is thriving, playing all the rough and tumble sports or whatever it is, right? Like my kids were never into those sports, but so for a boy to not be into those big competitive rough team sports, that's a challenging thing in this culture, right? We haven't evolved yet to the point where there are other options and other ways of connecting with other children, right? That's, that's the way. So it's just one example. And without bringing in too many labels and, you know, terminology into this conversation, I am curious where you see highly sensitive falling in the scope of neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. Highly sensitive is considered a neurodiverse temperament. It is a temperamental trait. And so it's not neurotypical. It is neurodiverse. So like dyslexia, like autism spectrum, um, a lot of people, a lot of people think that high sensitivity is just a different kind of language for autism. Um, but it's not, those are two separate things. People on the autistic spectrum can be highly sensitive, but just because you're highly sensitive, it doesn't mean you're on the autistic autism spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. But they are both neurodiverse. It's both under the umbrella of neurodiversity. Which is something that I think as a culture, we are making so many steps forward in understanding and and embracing and seeing in a positive light instead of, oh, you've got this terrible condition or some kind of deformity, which is so, so wrong, right? And it brings me to, um, I mean, knowing what we know about how healing it can be to just accept people as they are and and care for that orchid, orchid in the right environment, so many of the people that come to see me, and I have no doubt see you too, Cheryl, are were not raised in a in a world that openly accepts them as they are and loves them unconditionally. And they grow up with this idea that there's something wrong with me and I'm not yeah. normal. And you speak in your book about these two cultural ideas and concepts that have us believing and, and generating more anxiety, which is the myth of normal mm-hmm. and the expectation of happiness. Can you explain for our listeners a little bit about what those concepts are about and how they generate anxiety? Yes. The myth of normal is huge. Um, We still have some kind of idea in our mind generated by the culture, by the cultural imprints and images that there is a right way to be. And if you are not that way, then you are abnormal. What's the opposite of normal, right? It's abnormal. There's something wrong with you. And the shame, it creates shame, right? There's something wrong with me is shame. I'm broken, that's shame. Those are all the shames. I'm too much. I'm not enough. I'm inadequate. I'm unlovable. I'm unworthy, right? I'm, 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 I'm not even available. I'm not even worthy of love and belonging. Yeah. which is pretty much our deepest need, right? Is Especially that sense of- the safety, right? Like to safety. belong. To belong. That's what makes us feel safe is when we are healthfully attached and attachment is belonging. Belonging is attachment, right? And so when, we're, when we feel like we've just been cut, like the tether has been cut and we're free floating because we don't have that sense of belonging, often not even in our own families, right? Because we're getting the message, what's wrong with you? You're too much. Stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. All the messages about crying, about feeling, and not just tears, frustration, anger, any big emotion parents can have a hard time with. And look, it's hard. You know, I'm a parent. I get it. I was a parent to little ones a while ago. It's hard. Um, Parenting is not an easy path, but Our task as parents is to make as much room as possible for those feelings and to stay connected, right? The connection is everything. So when we grow up in those environments and then we take that into school and then maybe we take it into religion and then maybe we take it into our, our social, our friends, right? There's all these places where we then 
feel like I'm different. I don't fit the mold. I'm wired differently. I feel different than other people. There must be something wrong with me. And so when I'm working with people, it's the shame layer that needs to be addressed first. And it's it's tough because that is embedded deeply into our cells, right? Sometimes just from birth, it, babies are receiving the message of like, you're doing it wrong. Or maybe the mother wanted a boy and got a girl, or maybe, you know, the baby's colicky and crying and up all night. And it's like, not what you expect. And this is not not to blame mothers. Again, parenting is really hard and our culture is not set up to support family units, not set up to, to support parents. So I'm not into blaming anyone, right, for how we got here. It's it's multi-layered and complex how we got here. But the end result is a tremendous amount of shame. And we can't do a whole lot of inner work, even with the anxiety, until we're working with the shame. So yes, like you said, the shame creates its own anxiety, right? And the anxiety is an offshoot of the shame. They're working in tandem. The shame I see also as a protective layer, as a defense that grows to say, well, it gives some sense of control. If I believe there's something wrong with me, then I can fix it. And that's often where the perfectionist is born, which a lot of highly sensitive people, and I know the people who come to you are on that track of, I will just be perfect enough, right? I will get to perfection so that I can outrun that shame belief. And I will somehow be above it, which of course does not exist, is in impossible. It's like, I'll get to my flaws before you can, before they can judge me for it. <laughs> yes. Or I will be flawless. I will be as flawless as possible so that I am above reproach and above criticism. And I've now gathered some false sense of control, right? To manage what's underneath which is the shame, yeah. which is really a very tightly constructed and woven shame story that needs to be unraveled over time and with different practices. And so the myth of normal, well, you know, there is no normal. I've worked with enough people. I've been doing this for enough years to know that most, if, if everyone's carrying that myth, then who's normal, right? Who, who's the who's the one that we, we all have some idea of like, oh, that girl in eighth grade, like she must never have worried about. Well, she does. She still did and she does too. Because I think that that crosses all boundaries, that place of there must be someone else out there who has it all together. Well, no, nobody, nobody has it all together. So normal is a myth. It does not exist. Um, and yet it's very compelling to think I am suffering and I am wired so differently. I just wish I was normal. I just wish I was normal, right? Which really means I just wish I wasn't suffering. But that again, that doesn't exist. Like to be human we, is to suffer. We all have our forms of suffering. What we can change is our relationship to it. And then the suffering goes down and shows up less often. But we're going to suffer, right? And and so likewise, the expectation of happiness or of, you know, one state of happiness, like as if we're, we're going to reach some kind of state and be unilaterally happy forever. There's, it's not, there's no angle. That's not how life works, right? We on, have period you mean I can't do enough self-development work and go to exactly. yoga classes and meditation to just be happy forever? Exactly. And drink enough green drinks and eat organic food and all the things. What's the point of any of it then, Cheryl? Yeah, I know. It's, I mean, it's a great hook, right? If I do everything right, I will be above pain and messiness. Yeah. And we see a lot of that, I think, in the yoga communities and in the self-help communities of just do it this way. And we hold out this promise and we will, we will transcend messy. And we will transcend hard and we will transcend pain. No, to me, the point of all of those beautiful practices are to learn how to be with, not transcend, but to be with. It's really attachment internally. It's internal attachment. It's showing up as a loving parent to our own inner child, 
right? So that when pain or messy or groundless or vulnerable shows up, that we say, oh, there's that hard feeling. I can be here with it. Yes, there's going to be some knee-jerk default part of me that wants to get rid of it because it's hard, right? But over time and with enough mindset shifts and practices that are in place, we do learn to dive in and move toward it. Okay, here's this new, here's the next hard thing. What, did I really think I was done with hard things? No, here's the next layer. I talk a lot about layers and spirals in my work. It's it's not a straight line. It's layers and spirals, the inner work, right? And we're just layering in and layering in and layering in. And then the next hard thing and okay, now I can, I can, I can fall into the illusion of I'm just going to ignore it. But like for where I am in my personal practice, that's not even an option in my mind at all, right? Yeah. Of exactly. I'm just going to ignore it. That doesn't even occur to me. It's okay. I'm, this is freaking hard. And here we go. I'm yeah. diving yeah. in. And what I deeply know and trust in my bones is that when we dive in with resources, with support, whatever we need to be able to go into the dark, right? That we come out with more light every time. We come out with a deeper connection to ourselves, to the divine, right? To other humans, so we're all suffering. We come back with these runes of wisdom, right? Oh my gosh. I, I just needed a moment there. That's just like runes of wisdom. How, what a beautiful way to describe it. And I think if that's not enough for someone to, to think, wow, like I want to sign me up. I want to go on that journey. We've just got to look at this idea that whoever's selling the idea that you can just cure anxiety, fix anxiety, and it's never going to be there again. And then we're just happy forever. You're being sold a lie. Yes. This is the truth. We are here to grow and go on a journey of self mastery. And I just love how you describe it so much, Cheryl. And as we're talking about it, I'm having these realizations of just how deep the shame goes, mm -hmm. even in this evolving wave of conscious relating, which I think mm -hmm. is so, so beautiful. And, it, and that's another layer of growth, right? and an arena we can play in. But even there, I feel there is this expectation that eventually we're going to be in like this peaceful, perfectly happy, happy relationship where there are no problems. We're just in a perpetual state of bliss. If we're just conscious enough of our wounds mm -hmm. and their inner child and my inner child. Mm -hmm. And you said before, attachment is belonging. Mm -hmm. In the world of conscious relationships, it's all about moving away from codependency, moving away from attachment and kind of being in more of that Buddhist perspective. Yeah, you're shaking your head for anyone that's listening and not seeing the video. <laughs> Tell me what you think about that. Oh my gosh. I think that's such a harmful message. Um, and I hope we're moving away from that. I hope that all the research around attachment is helping people understand that when we are in an intimate relationship, any relationship, a friendship, a partnership, relationship with our children, we are actually sharing a nervous system. There is no real separateness. Yes, there's a separate I. Yes, we need to tend to ourselves as individuals, but we are actually literally in a symbiotic, like parent-child relationship with the people that matter most to us. So to take this mindset of, I shouldn't be affected by what you do. I should be over here and you over here. And we're just kind of living and we can, we can both come together in our very enlightened, separate kind of way. And it's not actually how it works on a biological level, let alone our hearts and our souls and our spirits, right? We are deeply attached to our partners and it should be that way. That is healthy. That is healthy attachment. Now, codependence and all that, you know, that that's a separate thing. And I think came from the addiction world, right? Where you are enabling somebody to um, act out from their wounds. That's not healthy, but that's not what attachment is for most people that I work with, certainly in my own marriage, right? Healthy attachment is we will hurt each other. 
and we will learn how to make repairs. It's rupture and repair, rupture and repair, rupture and repair over and over again. And people who are deeply steeped in the world of couples work, like Sue Johnson, who wrote Hold Me Tight and the whole EFT paradigm, which I think is absolutely brilliant, which is based on attachment theory, um, understand that the goal is not to never get snagged or caught with each other. That's going to happen probably in forever, right? That we will get snagged. We will trigger each other. We will hurt each other. We will be insensitive. We'll have an off day. We'll say something. It'll trigger an old place. The work, just like with our own indi individual work with anxiety, is to learn how to show up for that in an effective way, in a way that moves it through, that actually brings us closer together, right? Yeah. That helps us to show our vulnerability, helps us to go into the underneath places of what's underneath the triggers, help to, to let each other in, in the most vulnerable way, which very few people know how to do automatically because very few people grew up. I don't know anybody who grew up with parents who modeled that. Yeah. So we're just all learning this. What does it actually mean to be vulnerable? I think it's a word that's thrown around a lot these days. And I think most of that's good, but I think we still sometimes don't really understand what that looks like in an intimate, in a romantic partnership or even in a friendship or like, you know, with anyone that we're connected to, to go into the underneath place and to say, you know, when you said that, what I heard was or the story I'm telling myself is that maybe you think I'm stupid or, you know, and it touched that old place in me of uh, worrying that I'm not lovable, right? That's the vulnerability. Mm -hmm. That's what invites our partner in. Right? So it, that it, we're deepening the intimacy. And if we haven't connected to be able to accept ourselves, how can we accept our partner in that vulnerability and vice versa as well? You know, it's that level of, we, we're so often, we reject what we have, what we reject in ourselves in another person. Yes. And we can also help each other grow those places. Mm -hmm. So I think it's another myth to say we have to be at a certain level of development in order to receive love, right? We don't that we will never be an intimate relationship if we think we have to be healed before we get involved with somebody we heal together right we heal with each other we can we can think we have it all together and then we get into a relationship and all of our stuff is just right there waiting for us stuff that will never get triggered in the safety of a controlled environment of being single it's just not going to get triggered Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you just pointed that out because I am a single woman and filtering through all of that and this self-development world that tells me constantly, you don't love yourself enough. You've just got to love yourself more. No. If you loved yourself fully, you would have the partner. They would be here right now. No. Um, it's it's like, I'm aware of what you say. Like I hear that, but then it just comes back. That message is so powerful in society. And again, it's shame, isn't it? It is. It is shame. The shame oh. message is you don't love yourself enough. That's why you're not in a partnership. It's your fault, right? Well, there's plenty of people out there who don't love themselves and are in healthy relationships. So that can't possibly be true. Yeah. I would say everybody to some degree struggles with self-love mm -hmm. and they're still in healthy relationships. And so like from an attachment perspective, again, it's being in the relationship with all of our self-doubt and all of our shame. And to be able to say, I'm feeling so much shame right now. And to have somebody come in and be there with you is part of what heals the shame. I think there's all, we can only get to a certain point of self-love when we're single, right? I mean, I don't want to say that as a global statement because some people might choose to be single and that's great. But there's also many other relationships that are going to come into our lives. Again, not just an intimate partnership where we're going to get triggered into our shadow places and our wounds and our trauma places. And that's the invitation to grow. Yes, 100%. And I'd like to share a 
image that came or a metaphor that came to mind when you were describing the interconnectedness of our nervous systems when we are in a whether that's a romantic partnership or a family or even a friend group I would say Mm -hmm. and I don't know if it's the leaves on the cover of your book but Mm -hmm. what came to mind was this concept that I found amazing of learning how the trees in a forest are interconnected through mycelium right and it's invisible we can't see these little strings of fungus that that link the trees together but they communicate and they share nutrients and they help one another the forest it's not just one tree on its own those trees are all connected and speaking to each other and helping one another to survive and it's the same thing with our nervous systems in relationships isn't it it really is. And it's a beautiful, beautiful image that came to you. And it's exactly correct, right? We are sharing these underground root systems, these places that we can't necessarily see, but we feel them and we need each other. We need, just like we need the natural world, we're in reciprocal relationship, hopefully with the natural world. We're in reciprocal. It's all about relationships, it's all about our relationships right? And the levels of connection or disconnection. And so we, we need each other, right? We can't, I I think that's one of the things that we learned during COVID is we need each other. We don't do well in isolation we don't do well in separateness, right? And so, yes, in a family unit, I mean, you know, our kids are so attuned. If they walk into a room and my husband and I are at odds within a millisecond, they'll say, are you and daddy in a fight? You know, no one's even said a word. We could be on other sides of the house. Are you and daddy in a fight? They just take one look at our face. Are you and daddy in a fight? (laughs) Yes. Yeah, Yeah. you really can sense it. And actually, it's funny you mentioned that because something I've discovered in my uh, subconscious work when I've gone into using hypnotherapy to go back to past memories, I used to always think that I only knew there was a problem in my parents' relationship until they, the, when they, when they separated when I was 19, but mm-hmm. I have memories of being a three-year-old just sensing, and I'm standing in front of the television watching, you know, some child's program. And I just got this sense that my mom is in a, in the kitchen upset. And I don't know why, I don't know what the story is, but I can feel it. And that's made me feel upset. And I'm three, like it yes. blows my mind. <laughs> Absolutely. We're sensing everything all the time. We, it was things that are unsaid, things that are unseen. We're feeling them exactly right in the under, in the underneath, in the root systems, in the soil that we are these trees that are picking up on all kinds of signals all the time. And that's what I mean. The highly sensitive child is picking up even more than a typically wired child, right? It's picking up those unsaid, unseen in the invisible layer, the things that are going on. And now we know not even just in our own family systems, but in the intergenerational, what's been passed down, the unlived lives of our parents, right? Mm -hmm. The unhealed wounds of our parents, that that tends to get passed down to the most sensitive child in the family. So there's these layers and layers that we're only just starting to have words for, at least in Western culture. I think other cultures have known this for a long time, but we're starting to have more language for all the, all of the energy fields and all of the woundings, all of the tracks, all of the templates and patterns and beliefs and messages that get filtered down. And even the genetic imprint of intergenerational trauma fascinates me. Like when we see science catch up with what we know traditionally and intuitive yes I love it I love when science proves what we already knew exactly (laughs) it's just a confirmation so before we move on from the topic of relationships because there was a question I wanted to ask you because this comes up so often with not just my my friends and people in my life but my clients as well how do we know if we're in the right relationship, if we're triggered with anxiety, how do we know that that anxiety is not telling us intuitively this is wrong and get out or that that anxiety is just there to for us to work on something in ourselves? Yes. Well, it's the million dollar question because most people who find their way to my work find it through the portal of relationship anxiety, um, what is also called ROCD. So it's 
it's when people get stuck on that loop of I'm feeling anxious. Is it a sign that I'm with the wrong partner? Or is it something else, right? Is it a messenger that these are my own fears that are getting unleashed? So there's not a quick answer to that question. Um, but what I can say is that real and present danger anxiety, like there are red flags in the relationship that anxiety is alerting you to, like we talked about earlier, anxiety from our amygdala is saying there's a real problem here. Let's say this person is an addict. Let's say this person, I mean, there's all kinds of red flags that or a narcissist or isn't really tr truly emotionally available mm -hmm. or there's a massive misalignment in terms of our vision and our values right i definitely want to have children and right this person definitely does not want to have children something like that where there's no real way to compromise on that so mm -hmm. sometimes there are true red flags people who find their way to me very very rarely are there true red flags it's usually I'm with somebody who's emotionally available for the first time in my life. I was always chasing after somebody who was unavailable, one foot out the door. It was the pur pursuer distancer dynamic. They were distancing. I was pursuing very safe dynamic to feel all the in love and certainty, but I know I'm madly in love with this person because, oh, actually, if they would just turn to face me, all my fears would show up. So now for the first time, I'm with somebody who is available. And here's all my fears. And it can sound like relationship anxiety sounds like maybe I'm with the wrong partner. Maybe they're not this enough. They're not that enough. I always thought I'd be with somebody like this and this, whatever. It can sound all kinds of ways. We can get stuck in our heads. And this is where we're in the world of intrusive thoughts. This is where in the world of all kinds of intrusive thoughts that show up around relationship anxiety, but intrusive thoughts can show up around any type of anxiety. And so if we quiet enough to turn inside, quiet, drop down, drop in, there is a subtle voice inside that says, I know that this anxiety is, is mine. The anxiety is telling me that I'm scared of taking the risk of loving and being loved by an available partner, because it is the most vulnerable thing we do emotionally, right? It is actually as risky it's the, it's the modern day equivalent of living in more dangerous times when we had to be on high alert for the tiger in the bushes. Well, now the tiger in the bushes that our anxiety is telling us, danger, danger, danger. Well, yeah, actually there is a risk here. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to die, but it can sometimes feel like that. It can sometimes feel like these the the deepest fears that we carry inside are losing ourselves, enmeshment, engulfment. If we grew up in a in a parental relationship where our needs were bulldozed, sidelined, right? If we were a parentified child, then the fear of losing self and or the fear of losing other, right? the fear of being left, the fear of abandonment. But there's also all the other kinds of fears of like, you know, around honesty and is this person going to be faithful and is this person going to hurt me? And if we have any history around that, so relationships, when they are present and available, are an enormous risk. And our minds, our anxious brains will do all kinds of shenanigans to convince us, no, no, actually, it's because this person isn't tall enough, or actually, it's because this person isn't deep enough, or they're not spiritual enough, or they're not educated enough, or they don't make enough money, or they're just not who I thought, it just doesn't fit my picture. And so I got to go, right? And if we believe those thoughts will be, I got to go for the rest of our lives, right? Until we stop to say, okay, it's time to do my own work. 100%. And Cheryl, you know, I, I was the child with, or one of the many children with bulldoze needs by a parent and my father. And I have no doubt that on this journey, this is why I never say to people, I'm done with anxiety. It's just out of my life. Not only am I dedicated to authenticity and the truth and what's really going to help people, but gosh, of course, stuff's going to get triggered for me. You know, when I do embark upon that next relationship, that is that healthy dynamic. That yes. is, I know all of this stuff's going to come up for me. Absolutely. And 
And that's okay. And that's another layer of growth and another layer of learning. You know, I have so much awareness and so much that I can do on my own, Mm -hmm. but those thoughts are going to be there and I'm going to have to do the work. I'm going to have to tune in and I'm going to have to do all the practices that can help me work through that. So yeah, it's like, it's such a, the, the journey really does never end. And I love being able to be an example of someone who's not on the pedestal, not saying to everyone that I help like, hey guys, like, look at me, my life's perfect. Mm-hmm. We just never get there. We're no. always growing. Always growing at every stage of life, always growing. So I love that you have that mindset. You know, it's all going to be waiting for you. It's so like, buckle up, you know, here I go. And some sense of, okay, I'm gonna, <laughs> it's going to be hard. But I'm going to face it and I'm going to claim it and I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to grow from it. I mean, the amount of healing and growth my husband and I have done together, there's no words. And of course, we're still every day, every day, something, you know, it's not that we get triggered every day. It's just some little awareness or some way that we move closer together or some little little piece that just kind of falls into more place. And then we will get triggered and, oh my gosh, and it's horrible. And it's just the worst, just the worst, right? Because we are so deeply attached. And to me, that's a sign of healthy attachment that neither of us can tolerate being disconnected from each other. All four of us in our family, no one can tolerate a disconnect and a rupture. It is unbearable. And to me, that's a sign of health. Yes. And thank you for speaking to that because the the myth of normal, I would say, infiltrates relationships to such a great degree as well. It's like, that's yeah. not normal. You should, you know, this these, these people have these like concepts of like, how often should you have sex? How often should you fight? How often should you, you know, is this normal? Is this normal? And there is no normal. There is no normal and all the shoulds. And I talk a lot about shoulds, you know, and the the word should is as soon as you're in should, you're in some kind of externalized template of what the culture has told you, what you've absorbed along the way. We should be having sex this many times a week or a month or a year or whatever it is. And there is no should, there is no normal, there is no checkbox. And that comes from the anxious mind too. Well, if I just know what that number is, then (laughs) somehow safeguard against the relationship falling apart. Right? Yeah. It's like ch- checking off the household chores. Like, have I yes. checked off the chores of my relationship? Cool. It's all controlled. <laughs> it's all controlled. I, you know, I've now circumvented the possibility of loss. I'm hedging my bets. I'm doing it all. It's the perfectionist. Again, I'm going to do everything right. And that's where the relationship anxiety comes in. But what if I've missed something and then down the road, something terrible happens and it will have been my fault because I won't have scoured the relationship 5,000 times. Oh, but I didn't do it 5,001 times and I missed some, something, but really what are we trying to protect against? We're trying to protect against the fear of loss. Yeah. That's what's at the core. If I do everything right, I won't lose the person that I love or I won't be left or something bad won't happen. And so much of anxiety, and I talk about in the book, that is an attempt to have control and to circumvent doubt. And one of the medicines is growing trust practices because we cannot predict what's going to happen five years from now. We can't predict what's going to happen five minutes from now. Yeah. And so it's landing ourselves in some place of okay well if that bad thing happens I will handle it somehow but here we are right now right what is real and present right now is this relationship the question that I often ask people around relationship anxiety and it's a good cut through question it doesn't solve the whole thing by any means but is this is this partner someone with whom you can learn about love Mm, so good so good and that's why with my full awareness that 
that next partner will trigger so much anxiety through that process. I'm like, bring it on. I want to learn about love. I'm so excited about that to learn more about love than I currently know. I think I know so much, <laughs> but life is always going to have so much to teach me too. Yes. And is the person also willing, right? Are you willing to learn about love together? Do you have that growth mindset together? If you hit a stumbling block, and it feels insurmountable. Are you willing to seek help? Are you willing to go to therapy together? And so that's the question I ask people like before they get married, is this someone with whom you can learn about love and are, and is your partner willing? Is there a willingness in your partner to grow with you? Now that doesn't mean, cause that can snag people. Well, my partner doesn't go to self-help workshops and my partner doesn't go to yoga and my partner isn't in therapy. My part. Okay, fine. Is your partner willing to grow? Because there are many ways to grow, right? Would they be willing to go to a couples therapist with you mm -hmm. if you needed that extra support? Yeah. And that's really all we're looking for. I mean, yes, you want to be well-matched and yes, you want to, you know, a baseline level of friendship and connection and you actually like each other. But the things that we think are so important, like, um, I don't know. We place physical attraction very, very high on the list. And I break that down. I define attraction very differently from how most people define attraction. So that's probably a whole other conversation, but it can filter into the anxiety conversation because we have these ideas of, well, there must be something wrong. If I'm not wildly attracted to my partner every second of every day, if I want, don't want to rip my partner's clothes off every time I see them, right? Well, then it must be wrong. It must be the wrong relationship. And then the anxious mind can start to spin. Which is another offshoot of the expectation of happiness everlasting. And yes. yeah. And happily even, ever after. Mm -hmm. Totally. And all the movies that we see and, you know, like look at what a happy relationship looks like. They're smiling all the time. And yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't ever really see an actual relationship in the movies because so many of the movies end once they finally get together. It's pursuer distancer. It's the chase. It's the drama, the whole film. And then in the last 10 seconds, finally, they fall into bed ecstatically and have, you know, perfect sex. But we don't see a lot of images of like, what does a relationship actually look like? We yeah. just see all the drama around it. And then we see, we still have this message of happily ever after. Yeah. You know, we still have like the Prince Charming, the one, the soulmate, all of these ideas that are pretty damaging. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And look, I didn't know that our episode was going to go so far down the anxiety in relationships category, but seeing as it's such a popular conversation that you have in your work, I'm I'm very glad we have because it's obviously very pertinent for people and very important that we do. You mentioned some trust practices before. Mm. Can you share out a, one or two? I don't know how long they take to explain for you, Cheryl, but can you dive into the trust practices and what that's about? Well, I think everybody, I encourage people to find their own trust practices because for me, trust practices are spiritual practices and spirituality is such a personal individual path for many people these days because there's been a mass exodus from organized religion. And so the practices that people have been given historically have come from religion. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of good that has come from that, of having the, the trust of a community of people you know, the trust of a relationship to God. And a lot of people that just doesn't speak to them or there's been religious trauma or damage. And a lot of people, they just, that's not their way anymore. And so I think we're at an exciting, but also scary threshold of finding the practices that speak to us. Um, this practices that help us find a sense of rootedness, a sense of anchoring, a sense of expansiveness. Um, so for some people, a lot of people, that's a nature practice. That's having an active relationship with nature. For some people, it's dream work. I work a lot, a lot, a lot with dreams in my work. So writing down dreams every morning and, and developing a relationship to the unconscious, to the world of imagery and metaphor, not taking dreams literally because the unconscious does not speak literally. It speaks in the language of metaphors. Totally. And uh, the anxiety would grab that dream and be like, oh my God, I dreamed of a snake. That means there's like someone coming to get me a snake in my life. Like <laughs> take it literally. Yes. Just yeah. like our thoughts and our intrusive. If you take them literally, you're going down the rabbit hole really fast of anxiety. 
Right. So dreams are a wonderful practice to work with that anxious mind that wants to take everything at face. The literal mind wants to take everything at face value. Um, you know, for some people, it's a prayer practice. For some people, it's a meditation or yoga practice. Um, the practices that you know when you're there, when it's when it when you have that sense of both being anchored and expanded, earth and sky, right? And you have that sense of everything's okay, right? Even though there might be things that are not okay, that there is a place where everything is okay. And that's the deepest place of trust, right? That we, that I believe that we grow over time with daily practices, right? My practice is going to look different from your practice, right? And that's the beauty of where we are in today's world, that we each get to find our own way that speaks to our soul, our soul's way. And we get to experiment and we get to trial and error and we get to say, okay, well, for that person, I guess meditation works really well, but eh, it doesn't really work so well for me. I mean, I happen to love meditation, but but I know a lot of my clients, it doesn't work so well. I'm a big journaler. I have a daily journaling practice since I was six years old. I barely even call it a practice. It's just it's just what I do every single day. Like I breathe and I eat breakfast. I journal. A lot of people, that's not their way and that's okay, right? So trust is also self-trust very much. Self-trust to learning to trust what speaks to you, what works for you. Um, trust is trusting in others, right? In the human outside of us, friendship, community, supports therapists animal world like all beings and trust to me I, I conceive of trust as three pillars it's it's the inner pillar of self-trust it's a pillar of trusting in others and community and then it's a pillar of invisible realm dreams creativity spirituality nature ancestors rituals can I just, oh, so you weren't finished. Go, go, well, keep. just that when we're rooted, to me, I always conceive of it like a tree, that the tree, the tree metaphor is the trees are so deep. Trees are mothers for me. The trees in our property are part of my attachment practice that when we are going back to attachment, when we are attached in all in these three pillars and in the trunk and in the branches and the roots in the sky, we feel safe and it's really all about safety. Anxiety is I'm not safe. I'm not safe. I'm not safe. And so the opposite of that is where do we find safety? How do we create those practices and commit to them and do them so that we create inner and outer safety? Oh, Cheryl, I just have to feed back to you how artful that response is in a world where we have an ego and it is so tempting as when you want to help people and you're the therapist or the coach or the counselor to want to give advice. I mean, counseling by default is not giving the advice, right? It's holding the space, but to put that power and, and autonomy back on the other person and really give them, you know, and how beautiful for, for trust, building trust. It's like, you trust yourself, you know, what works for you and you can develop this within yourself. That is yeah. so profound and amazing. And I just like want to honor you for that for a moment because mm -hmm. it is, it, mm -hmm. it's rare. Like we don't, we don't all do it all the time. Yeah. I think it's a, core foundational piece of working with somebody if you're going to work with a therapist or a coach that that is at the very core that they are there to help you find your voice right not to take on their voice because again a lot of us did come from narcissistic parents where it was all about taking on their voice or a religious system where it was all about taking on and that's how self-trust gets ruptured as we learn to externalize and so if that happens in a setting where we're there for our own healing, it can be then a rupture, right? It can be another trauma on top of the trauma of, wait a minute, but I was here to try to heal and find my self-trust, not to do what you want me to do, but to connect to what's real and true inside of me. Yeah. Because we all have our own wisdom. We all have, I am blown away every single day of my life by the wisdom that shows up in the people that I work with, in my children, 
people on my courses, people writing on my forums. I'm like, God, there is so much where everybody has it. Everybody. And that's, that's the gold. Yeah. Yeah. What a place to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Gosh, mm. what a, I'm so excited for this episode to go out. And I would love to have you back on the show at some point as well, because I feel like there was all this other stuff we could have explored too. But yeah. before I do let you go, for those who are listening and are absolutely like haven't discovered you yet and want to know more about where they can find you and the exciting things you've got going on, where can they find you, Cheryl? So my website is conscious-transitions.com and I write a weekly blog there so people can sign up for my newsletter. It goes out every Sunday. I've been writing that since 2009. Um, yeah, and I have not long missed time. a week. So it's been a long, dedicated practice. Um, on there, you find all of my offerings, my free offerings, my courses, I have a course coming up at the end of March. It's my open your heart course. It's to grow love and attraction. Um, so it's one of my 30 day courses that I, I love. I actually haven't offered it live in two years. I'm on Instagram at wisdom of anxiety. And um, I have a podcast with my niece, Victoria called gathering gold. That is for highly sensitive people struggling with anxiety, um, searching for more self-compassion and um, recognizing that the shame piece is very much up on our the topics that we share. But we dive pretty deeply into topics that highly sensitive people tend to struggle with and tend to have a lot of shame about. Which is so important that we start undoing that more and more and the layers and layers of it. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I'll have all that information linked in the show notes for everyone. Thank you once again. Thanks for the work that you do and Thank spreading you. the message that anxiety is a message. I just love your work so much. Thank you, Thank Cheryl. You. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. We have reached the end of this episode. If you enjoy this podcast and you find it helpful, I would really appreciate it if you would hit subscribe or share this episode on your Instagram stories and make sure you tag at Georgie the naturopath. But that is all for today. Please be kind to yourselves. Know that you are enough and you are exactly where you need to be. Mm-hmm.